Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. Uh, my name is George Berwick, as Michelle said, and I'm the manager of what is called Multiple Sclerosis and Parkinson's Tissue Bank, uh, which is located at uh, the Imperial College in London. Right, so the Brain Bank does uh, do a few things, uh, not just collecting tissue, uh, which is obviously one of the major activities that, that we do, but to start with Parkinson's UK, which has been funding us for now almost 20 years, we're part of their research strategy, uh, part of this whole effort in the UK and worldwide to unravel what's going on in Parkinson's disease. Uh, we work with researchers supplying tissue, providing um, expertise on how to work with human tissue, which is not always the easiest source of material for research. And we also provide educational support to health professionals working with people with Parkinson's, helping them understand what's behind the Parkinson's as it is in, in terms of pathology, how does it look in the brain and so on. And finally, we work with our donors and relatives, providing the information about Parkinson's disease, providing feedback, uh, telling people what we actually found. And I'll show you a little bit later on that it, this is a quite important area that we do and uh, especially through reporting, providing neuropath reports and other, other information. Uh, so the Brain Bank is essentially trying to be a coordinating body which puts all these efforts together in order to come with new solutions in Parkinson's disease. Uh, as a whole movement, uh, biobanking, we are developing uh, in one of the most important resources for research and uh, in addition to all the other types of studies that we see in science these days, uh, whether it's in a dish, using cells, animals, even computers, uh, using human tissue as a source of information should come either at the beginning of the project to give people some kind of ideas which way to go, or even more importantly at the end of the project, which is part of this what we call translational process, translational research, where researchers will by using human tissue, find out whether that protein or gene they identified is actually relevant uh, for someone with Parkinson's disease. So they will check whether that's actually present in the brain, whether it's present in the brain of someone with Parkinson's, and based on that, decide where they're going to go next. So again, being a part of this overall effort to, to unravel what's going on in Parkinson's disease. Uh, the Brain Bank, as any other Brain Bank, is running a, uh, a donor scheme and uh, we are one of those rare UK Brain Banks. We cover all of the territory of the UK and consequently our donor scheme is UK wide. So anywhere people anywhere in the UK are welcome to sign on our donor scheme, whether it's Parkinson's or MS. And uh, we also interact with major Parkinson's cohorts. One of them is the Oxford Discovery, also Proband, Pine in Scotland and so on. Uh, this is a very important approach, uh, so we do this to avoid bias in any way. So we collect as many uh, donations from anywhere in the UK, therefore we represent whatever is going on in the Parkinson's community out there in the UK. We'll have some tissue samples, which is quite important for research, so we sort of can supply absolutely any type of Parkinson's or any type of Parkinson's related conditions to any researchers in the world and, and in the UK. Uh, the actual registration process is uh, as simple as it gets. Uh, what we need people is to decide to actually donate tissue and then to request a donor pack which consists of several forms. These are forms that gives us uh, actually authorization to collect the tissue, to collect the data, to look at your medical records and so on and to collect some more information such through health questionnaires and other types of questionnaires. Uh, you will probably receive a latest newsletter which will tell you a little bit about what we're doing, what we've done in the previous year, and there will be an envelope to, to help you, um, you send it all back. It's a free post envelope. Absolutely anyone can donate tissue, whether you have Parkinson's disease, whether you have Parkinson's related conditions such as MSA and PSP. Uh, there are some situations where we cannot collect tissue. If there is a presence of other type of major pathology, such as stroke or tumors, cancers, and so on, uh, this makes uh, the whole pathology rather complex. So when we would supply this tissue to researchers, 
they wouldn't really know whether what they're looking at is coming uh, a result of Parkinson's disease or a major stroke or, or a metastatic tumor or primary tumor in the brain, so on. So unfortunately, these donations have to be declined. And the other conditions such as Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease so, uh, uh, and systemic infections, they need to be rejected due to health and safety concerns for our researchers. We also need uh, those individuals who don't have any kind of neurological condition. They're very important as controls because they help us set a threshold for all the research uh, that's been done on these brains. So they're quite important. And we also need controls, those people who are related with, to someone with Parkinson's, although they don't have Parkinson's, don't, don't show any signs of Parkinson's. They're also excellent controls for genetic studies. The tissue bank has been for many years organized as a transplant unit, so we were available 24 hours a day. Unfortunately, other uh, organizations don't follow this pattern anymore, so now we are more, more or less nine to five um, uh, operation, and, but we, we managed to collect, uh, with the exclusion of all the criteria that I mentioned already, almost 95% of all the donations that come to us. Uh, the most important thing is to inform the tissue bank, um, inform in a way of not only when someone dies, but also inform during, during the lifetime to tell us about change of address, because we lo lose a lot of people because they just move and they don't tell us where they are at the moment and so on. Uh, and also, but to, to tell us in good time that something has happened, obviously a donor has passed away, and at that point, Tissue Bank will take over the organization of tissue donation. So we're not going to burden relatives with any of this. Uh, we will get in touch with, uh, with a doctor to, to arrange the death certificate. Uh, we'll do all the admin, uh, make all the mortuary arrangements, uh, transport the tissue, bring it back into the lab, do preservation, and so on. Uh, the most important thing is that this will not delay any of the funeral ar arrangements. And this is all done within 48 hours because that's the, that's the best time in which tissue, brain tissue can be collected. Uh, the, probably the, the, the most important thing is that the whole operation is done locally in the nearest hospital. And therefore, uh, there is no uh, taking the body or anyone anywhere else. It's just all done locally. Only tissue is collected and brought back to London for tissue preservation. Once we get a brain, we have to essentially open the brain. We have to slice it, look at the major areas that are affected by Parkinson's disease. And one of them is what you see down here. It's substantia nigra, or the brain stem, where the substantia nigra is. So it's filled with dopamine-producing cells. And uh, this is the first time we can actually see whether the clinical diagnosis actually probably correlates uh, with pathology. If we don't see a nicely pigmented substantia nigra, we can suspect there's a Parkinson's disease there. Uh, once the brain is sliced, what we do, we place the brain on these uh, uh, grids and then we cut along the grid lines and we will separate it into smaller blocks which will be individually frozen and kept at minus 80. And this is the frozen tissue, frozen samples. The most important thing about the grid system is that this allows us to pinpoint different anatomical areas, those that are relevant to Parkinson's and those that might be relevant for Parkinson's disease, uh, such as the one, uh, for instance, uh, hippocampus is quite of interest because hippocampus is a place where we find those endogenous brain stem cells. So some people are interested in looking at these stem cells and asking questions why they're not doing anything in Parkinson's disease, whether they're capable of repairing tissue and so on, uh, not to mention finding where the substantia nigra is, which is relatively easy, and so on. So this is all done with a reasonable degree of precision so we can identify different parts of the brain and provide different parts of the brain tissue to researchers, whatever they're doing, whatever kind of research they want to do. So as I said, we will, depending on, uh, on certain conditions before death and after death, we will end up with two major types of samples according to preservation. We can either have frozen tissue, uh, which is when the post-mortem time is rather short, under 24 hours. Uh, this is a high quality tissue, what we say, it's a sort of a lifelike. And uh, this can be used in absolutely any experimental technique that we have these days. So the most important resource of, uh, of human tissue for researchers. 
And mostly important for what they call these omics studies like genomics and proteomics, a major, uh, major uh, sort of a breakthrough in science where we are not sort of limited to looking at just one protein, one gene at a time, but we can look at thousands of proteins and genes. So the omics has, allows, allows us to actually look at many, many different things at the same time. And the frozen tissue is perfect for this sort of studies. If the conditions are not that favorable for tissue preservation, uh, talking about brain, we're talking about very soft organ filled with blood, uh, which means that it will deteriorate very quickly after death. Uh, that's why we just have a really short window in which we can freeze the tissue. If that's missed, we will uh, fix tissue in formalin and uh, we'll end up with samples who are very, which are very easy to store. To store. So you can store them on, on, on the shelf. Uh, these are formalin fixed samples and they serve mostly as archival material and also for studies of pathology. Pathology really relies on formalin fixed processed embedded samples because it uh, gives you a perfect morphology. You can identify every single cell. You can do the staining, you can do diagnostics, and so on. Uh, so important thing, obviously, a carbon material means that we can look at this tissue some years later on and see whether there are any changes uh, in brains that we collected 20, 30 years ago to whatever we collect today or in 10 years' time. And also, which is a quite handy thing, formalin fixed brains can be actually scanned in the MRI machine which allows you to essentially improve one of the diagnostic techniques. Uh, this is not used in Parkinson's yet. We had some studies which used our brains to improve some of the diag imaging techniques. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's one of the ways to actually not only improve the MRI, but also to correlate what the MRI, the imaging techniques are seeing in the brain with what we're seeing by doing pathology, which is rather simple compared to the MRI. The next stage is probably the most important one, which is screening and classification. So we will look at certain areas of every single brain, and we will come up with a final diagnosis. And this is, uh, whether to say unfortunately or not, uh, it's, it's the most accurate diagnosis that you can get uh, from someone with Parkinson's disease. And the most impressive thing for me has been always that just looking at this tissue, as some people said it, it's a scene of a crime and all the culprits, everything that's causing the problems is in that bit of tissue or every single bit of brain tissue. So what we need to do essentially is find ways of unraveling these processes, these mechanisms that might be influencing Parkinson's disease, causing Parkinson's disease and etc. in this part of the brain. That's why human tissue is so valuable for future research and for, for current research in Parkinson's. So, what we do with every sample that, as I said, selection of samples, we'll cut some very thin sections, we'll do some staining, and the basis of this, we'll, we'll send these slides to a neuropathologist, who, and they will come with a, with a diagnosis. And uh, pathological diagnosis is slightly different from, from the clinical diagnosis. Uh, clinical diagnosis will vary, and, and neurologists will, might, might add many more other things to this side, but neuropathological diagnosis is very much an organized uh, well, we think it's a very organized area, and it's all about uh, confirming that pathology exists in the brain, so confirming the presence of Parkinson's disease, and also staging Parkinson's disease using the system developed by a new German neuropathologist called Brach uh, into sort of uh, early Parkinson's, which is a low stage Brach, Brach 1 or 2, to over established PD to sort of a late, late Parkinson's disease combined with dementia, all based on the spread of alpha-synuclein pathology throughout the brain. Uh, we also detect other types of pathology in the brain, and I'm going to show you a few, few uh, cases we got, and I'll show you how much this can vary with, between different, different brains. So this is all about importance of pathology. Now, once we get, uh, once we finished with the neuropathological diagnosis, what we usually see is probably uh, this case on the top, which is Parkinson's disease, advanced Parkinson's disease, so usually combined with dementia, where alpha synuclein is spread throughout the brain, present in the cortex, present in all the other parts of the brain, and there's a degree of Alzheimer pathology there. So now, we don't know how much of this pathology contributes to anything in Parkinson's, but it's quite 
important to have accurate diagnosis, especially if you're thinking about developing some, uh, some kind of individualized therapy, sort of set using, choosing the drugs on the basis of someone's individual type of condition. So you probably need to know that this, this person has Parkinson's disease, but you also need to know that it's got a little bit of Alzheimer's disease developing and so on. Um, so this is, uh, and then if you look at the uh, paragraph underneath, uh, here, again, someone who clinically was diagnosed as, as Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease patient, but this is someone who's got ad advanced Alzheimer's disease as well as Parkinson's disease, which is sort of intermediate uh, level. Uh, so this is either mixed dementia or Lewy body variant, as they used to call it. Now, those were the usually, what, that's usually what we get, so we're not talking about misdiagnosis of Parkinson's disease, we're just talking about that it's not fully diagnosed. There are other things that occur in the brain, usually linked to Alzheimer pathology or vascular pathology, such as mini strokes, problems with blood vessels, and so on. However, there are cases that come to us like this, one on the top, uh, someone with very mild Alzheimer pathology, we call these cases control cases but it had a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and someone which worried us all a lot, uh, someone who came to us as a Parkinson's disease patient, turns out to have a Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or mad cow disease as it's known. Uh, so you can see that pathology does really unravel everything that's going on behind the actual clinical signs of things. And then it's quite important to, to have a decent number of cases to, to continue pursuing this avenue of, of uh, research and se selecting material in order to help actually clinical, full clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Now, the main, as I said, main area of our activity is supporting research and the Brain Bank uh, is quite proud of, of being a, one of those wide reaching brain banks supporting uh, research throughout the world. And I believe that we've been in contact with more or less anyone uh, who's been doing any kind of research in Parkinson's over the past 15, 16 years. And the whole aim is obviously some basic, answer some basic questions, why cells die in Parkinson's, uh, how can we develop better treatments, the better methods of diagnosing Parkinson's disease, identify susceptibility, again using biomarkers, and even prevent Parkinson's if possible. Uh, majority of studies look at the mechanisms of cell death, uh, whether it's involving neurotoxic components, uh, what's the role of actually, what's, what is the role of alpha synuclein, Lewy bodies, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're just um, just consequence of, of the disease process. Uh, looking at, uh, again, role of inflammation, that's always a popular question, how much of inflammation is there in the Parkinson's brain? And then looking at actually how the, how the disease spreads throughout the brain, which is talking about Brach staging and so on. Also, another popular area of research is uh, genes in Parkinson's disease, uh, why people actually get Parkinson's, which set of genes cause Parkinson's disease, what, which set of genes makes you susceptible to Parkinson's disease. So this is an ongoing study. And uh, we've been, uh, we also uh, identify a lot, of, uh, a lot of cases where there is a, there's a gene that's uh, in, involved in familiar cases of Parkinson's, so it's one of those Parkin genes, and so on. So that can be, that's the information that's sent back to relatives, and we can then refer them for genetic counseling. Uh, finally, we need a bit of help, and that, that means that we need more donors. Uh, at this point, I would probably have to say thank you to about 200 people from the Oxford uh, cohort who have signed up on the, on the tissue bank uh, register. If you're still thinking about it, um, well, I'm not going to say please sign on, on the register. It's not something that we do. We don't really uh, push people into making this decision. But uh, what I want to say is that, yes, we think about the brain bank and probably think about it's something that's linked to death. And it's not. It is at the end of the day, but uh, the main aim is to collect as much data as possible. And we're talking about this very popular phrase these days, big data. The bigger the data, the better the chances of coming up with that little thing that we need to pursue to find a new avenue of research, new drug for Parkinson's disease. And that's why we need actually a way to collect as much data as possible. And that's what the Oxford 
cohort is doing, Oxford, Oxford Center is doing, that's what the Brain Bank is doing, and that's what we're hoping to set up probably in the future, something along the lines of PD register. Uh, we have this sort of thing in multiple sclerosis, it's called MS register, and this is an organization that collects data through patient participation, so filling in surveys, providing your own experience of Parkinson's disease. And each of these is very unique to you. And as you've seen, pathology is very unique to every single one of those people with Parkinson's. So the data that you can provide will be a unique set of data, and we can put it together and come up with something very relevant. And uh, tissue samples without data are, I'm afraid, are useless. We just have a bit of brain with some pathology, and we really don't know the background story. So, you know, if it's a scene of a crime, you need to have some witnesses, you need some data from those witnesses, and you need to find out where is it all going. So it's very important that you participate in any way you want to participate. Donating data is, is pretty much uh, a ba bare minimum if, you, if you're willing to do that. And if you're willing to go a little bit further and donate your tissue when the time comes, we would be more than grateful. Uh, if anyone or any of you decides ever to, to come to, I mean, you, you have the Oxford Brain Bank, so you really don't need to go all the way to London, but we, we do have uh, all sort of open days, or we can just agree with you if you have a nice little group of people who would like to see what we're doing, and uh, we can organize a little tour of the Brain Bank, show you how it's all done, why we're doing it, you can talk to neuropathologists, researchers, and so on. And I would like to thank you for your attention.